Justin K. Hughes, licensed professional counselor here. I am so excited to join with you in this live stream, August 25th at 6 p.m. Standard, Central Standard Time. Uh, we have viewers from all across the world. Uh, even got an email from someone in Australia, curious about their time. So uh, shout outs to you all the way down under. Uh, tonight, we are going to get into a lot of details about effective evidence-based treatments for obsessive compulsive disorder, exposure and response. We're going to talk about lots of details. We have 15 key areas that we're going to cover tonight with a live Q&A. A uh, brief introduction about myself. Of course, I'm Justin K. Hughes. I'm a member and or contributor to the International OCD Foundation, OCD Game Changers, and OCD Texas. And uh, you can find me practicing here in Dallas in private practice. I'm the owner of Dallas Counseling PLLC. I'm a clinician, writer, and uh, ferocious advocates for the OCD sufferer and those involved. Hey, by the way, you can download these slides right away, right now, free PDF. If you go here, point your smartphone camera at the QR code or go to justinkhughes.com slash get unstuck. So this, that'll actually make it a little bit easier to grasp some of the material and feel free to work ahead. If you get bored, surely not. <laughs> All right, so uh, just a couple more uh, details, kind of not really housekeeping, but a little bit about me. I am a total nerd. Anybody who <laughs> knows me, loves me, uh, tolerates this, uh, and you're going to see that come out tonight, but it doesn't mean we can't have fun, right, if we're going to be a nerd. Uh, I'm married to Emily, my beautiful wife, have two wonderful kiddos. We have a newborn, he's about five months old, and a four-year-old, uh, music lover, coffee lover, I'm the Dallas advocate for OCD Texas, which is the International OCD Foundation affiliate in the state of Texas. And uh, I serve on the IOCDF faith-based task force as well. So the super nerd, yeah, one of my friends and colleagues, she's a counselor as well in the area, is always amazed at how excited that I seem with things like this. This was me uh, doing the influencers presentation at the OCD SoCal conference in July. And uh, it's true. Like I get excited about this stuff, but you want to know why I get excited because it makes a difference and uh, these things done well can really help and do work and there is hope. We're going to get into that. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. So we have some learning objectives here tonight. Uh, four things. Uh, by the way, this is for professionals. This is for sufferers. This is for family members. This is everybody. So I've given this talk uh, where CEUs, uh, professional education uh, credits have been granted, but I've also given it uh, in front of other folks. By the way, the original presentation was my good friend and colleague, Dr. Molly Martinez. Uh, we tag team this together. Uh, we developed this together and have made just a few small updates of color scheme and so forth, but just want to give her a shout out uh, for uh, being an essential part uh, of this development. All right, so the quick learning objectives. You can read, so I'll let you read there. Uh, fancy disclaimers, this is not therapy. Uh, I'm not saying that just from a legal standpoint. Uh, let me talk about the difference of education versus therapy. Education might teach you a concept. Tonight we're gonna talk about a lot of concepts, a lot of research and the evidence base. Uh, but when it comes down to concepts, putting it into practice, that's what therapy is all about. And it has to be highly personalized and someone has to uh, assess your specific situation. So if I give specific feedback, and I will tonight to questions and answers, I'm gonna to speak towards what does the research say? What are conceptual examples uh, and based on maybe a case or uh, a reference, but that can never be the same as therapy. Ideally, uh, if you need it, uh, you'll have your own specialized provider in this. Also, mature content, just heads up. Uh, some themes of a serious nature. We're going to have a lot of fun here, but it's kind of intended for those that are 15 and up, even though we will talk about children and teens. I have no financial conflict of interest, and for the Q&A, just make sure to use the comments. I uh, already have one sent in by a subscriber, uh, and we'll pop that up and give that uh, first priority. Um, but yeah, just type it in directly to YouTube, and uh, we'll get it going. Okay, so part one. I want to review the basics with you. 
what are the basics of OCD? Well, what is OCD? Obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a disorder really of three parts. You have intrusive, unwanted, and the recurrent persisted, persistent, intrusive, unwanted thoughts, urges, images, impulses. They're distressing, they're bothersome to the person. And the second part is compulsions. Uh, a lot of folks might not think that they have a compulsion. It might be something uh, mental, um, but these are still compulsions. And so uh, a compulsion is the response to get the relief because it's distressing or discomforting to leave that thing where it is. And then third of all, disorder or a certain amount of impairment is caused to actually be OCD. So a lot of folks are walking around with any number of subclinical symptoms, but to reach that threshold, we're looking for some very specific things. Uh, for treatments, there really are two gold standard treatments. And here's the thing, in psychotherapy, um, when you deal with different disorders, you may actually have multiple different treatments. Depression has multiple different successful therapy treatments, multiple different medications and classes of medications. Uh, and PTSD, three different evidence-based treatments uh, and various medications that are used. But with OCD, here's part of the beauty and the simplicity, at least from the starting point, the gold standard is going to be one type of therapy and generally one type of medications, unless if there is a remarkably strong reason not to. Exposure and response prevention is the therapy of choice. Gold standard, most randomized controlled trials, uh, again and again and again. We're going to talk about how it is difficult, how a lot of people will turn it down up front, right away, right off the bat. And unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people who don't complete the therapy. But tonight is all about making it more effective, making it better, personalized to the patient. And I think we can really increase the number of those that access it and actually find benefits. Uh, we'll talk about how much benefit on average a person can get if they stick with it. Uh, so SR SRIs are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, they would be all SSRIs except for one, which is clomipramine, which is uh, the original uh, medication. It's a little bit older, so it's not a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, but these are the gold standard treatments. Doesn't mean that we don't, so we'll talk about this later, diverge, add in some other things here or there, but this has to be the starting point if we're saying that we're being true to the evidence base at this point. Okay, so the full intro, you can go. I have another YouTube talk. Uh, check it out. Subscribe. Check out my videos. Uh, also, better yet, jump on my list, justinkhughes.com slash get unstuck uh, to be apprised and updated all these free videos and content. And I try to curate all the best of different resources, so conferences, local, national, worldwide, uh, so on and so forth. But go to the ERP for OCD uh, ultimate Guide to Treating OCD if you want the intro. Tonight is not the intro. Um, I'd still love you to join, but frankly, if you're totally lost tonight, you'll want to check out the intro first. Hate to lose you, but do that first before trying to understand these concepts here tonight. Trivia. So I'm going to pay attention to the comments here. Uh, I have had moments where comments are really lively and others where people just want to sit back. I get it. Hey, a lot of people here, it's dinner time trying to get kids down for bed, so that's totally cool. But uh, do you have a guess? Does anybody have a guess here what the average amount of symptom reduction after a trial of exposure and response prevention for OCD is? Any guesses in the comments? Also popping over. Thank you, Brizzle. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. A lot of us have to contribute to do our part. OK, we've got a guess here. Nate L, he guesses C. Think you're right? Yep, 60 to 70%. Nate, shout out. That was great. Whoa. <laughs> That's one of my favorite graphics. Keanu Reeves in the early days. Good stuff. 60 to 70% symptom reduction. We need to get this word out that when it's done, and to be fair, this is the research setting. Uh, there are some things that we can do to bolster these studies. The dropout rates can be high, but when it's working that well, they're doing something right. 60 to 70 percent. A lot of times this means moving from being impaired in life, maybe not working a job or not getting out of the house to working a job, getting out of the house. I see this every day, every month in my practice. And 
even for those that it's a slower journey uh, and who don't get this immediately in a trial, it's a powerful, powerful tool. That's what we're here to talk about. Okay, so take into account ERP is hard. It's not harder than living a life with OCD, I think. It requires planning adjustments and it doesn't always work as expected. Okay, so here's the next part after just the basic intro. Let's get to it. There are 15 different topics that we're going to overview, um, categorized in a few different areas, roughly fear-related issues, compulsive behaviors and rituals, and treatment planning problems. And by the way, I'm going to throw us therapists under the bus because <laughs> our own uh, competency and various things play into whether ERP is actually effective. All right. So fear-related pitfalls and solutions. Uh, it's well documented, already talked about it. The ERP is the gold standard for OCD, but we find from the research that it's actually really underutilized, um, especially in treating kids. So uh, why is this? I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. Therapists sometimes struggle. There are definitely some therapist fears that if a person hasn't received training, a lot of times there's fear for both a client and a therapist. So when therapists think about, man, do I want to actually train with someone for exposure and response prevention, uh, one of the things that I often say, like if you look around, like my office doesn't look like a dungeon. I don't, uh, I'm not just some weird creeper. You don't have to be a strange person. I mean, I might be a strange person, but you don't have to be some sort of strange person. You don't have to be doing all sorts. I mean, we do some seemingly wild things, but uh, the reality is it is about facing life on life's terms and getting people's lives back or getting it better than they ever had it. So to recover what was lost or to gain what was never there in the first place. Uh, so a lot of education, I think, has to happen for both uh, patients and providers so that they're less scared. Yeah, practi practicability and outpatient, sometimes it can be tricky. Um, anybody who's looked for an OCD specialist in even metroplexes like Dallas-Fort Worth know that it is hard to find specialists. Um, in all fairness, it can be tricky, especially if you need the amount of time that uh, sometimes 90 minute sessions, actually in the research, typically they're utilizing two sessions a week, 90 minutes. Is insurance gonna pay for that? Not in my experience. Um, are most people equipped in their outpatient setting to be able to do exposures in the office or go outside of the office? Uh, we have to ultimately to do that. And then last of all, there can just be negative perspectives. So even though this is actually therapist negative perspectives uh, by a study that was done, this also pertains to clients too. I've heard these things. Oh, exposure must be insensitive. It's rigid, ineffective, potentially iatrogenic, causing harm. There's the nerd in me. I actually leave words like that in. Please forgive me. Uh, it's not real world. It's unethical. These are PhD level psychologists reflecting their views of exposure when surveyed. Um, it was uh, Northern Europe, I forget which country. Um, and frankly, I hear it's here too in the States and we hear it worldwide. I've talked with uh, those who are in England, those who are in Australia as providers and um, just many different places. So what do we do? Well, things like this. Uh, if you are a professional, um, get trained, ask questions, uh, reach out to the International OCD Foundation. That's really where I fell in love with doing this work, um, was through my, what's called BTTI trainings. Uh, well, I fell in love well before, but I wanted to make this really my life work after I began to uh, be trained by the International OCD Foundation. I'd also done consultations prior and after, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to bore you with some of those details, but there's so many ways to get involved. Uh, never hesitate to... Uh, hit me up in the comments. Um, let me know uh, if you are desiring to be involved or to learn as a professional or a sufferer. Okay, so trivia. Jump to the comments if you want again. What population in the research is undertreated a majority of the time when exposure is indicated? My guess is people with OCD, those in poverty, children, Texans, what? <laughs> it's children. So maybe not that difficult of a guess, but 
as far as when we think of exposure therapy, there could be a lot of reasons why children are undertreated. So out of any population in the research, uh, the most undertreated. Uh, I know that folks will state overtly various fears um, about uh, treating kids. Oh my goodness, can you do exposure with children? Yeah, 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 of course. This is about facing life without compulsions and without the tricks that OCD plays on a person. Um, so you can absolutely do this with kids and it's very effective, very successful. It just has to be done well and sensitively. Okay, so pitfall number one, getting into it. Not addressing, not understanding the core fear. What is the core fear? Well, so because ERP, Exposure and Response Prevention, is a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy, as many would guess, um, we're not taking sessions on end trying to dig deeper and to put a finger on something that might be deeply under the surface that we don't know about. We develop this concept over time, uh, but it's basically trying to understand what's behind the thought or intrusion that a person has, aka why is that scary, why is that disgusting, why uh, does that bring shame or sadness, because OCD is not just a disorder of anxiety. Several years ago, we moved it away from an anxiety disorder categorization. It involves anxiety, but it's its own category because it also can involve disgust, shame, sadness, uh, dot, dot, dot. So OCD is a shapeshifter. Obsessions and compulsions often change. We compare it to the game of whack-a-mole if you ever went to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid or still. <laughs> uh, and play the game of whack-a-mole where you might think that, okay, I'm done, but then the game throws you a curve and there's another mole. Pops up, oh my goodness! Well, OCD does this all the time. So a person can also feel really discouraged in their recovery. Well, a specialist is going to help you chart this out, plan it out, and also know what's expected versus oh, what's unexpected. Uh, so uncertainty is a really common thread as well. So uh, uncertainty can be very much a part of the core fear. Uh, so let's just take a classic contamination obsession. If I touch this thing without washing, um, maybe I could get sick. Okay, well, core fear conceptualization, we're going to dig into that and understand it a little bit more uh, by a few basic questions. We'll oftentimes utilize what's called the uh, downward um, arrow technique, excuse me, uh, to understand this. So uh, actually, let me use the example that's on here. The compulsion, if it's checking that the stove is off, maybe the obsession is I might have left the stove on and maybe it burned down the house, etc. So the therapist will ask a few questions to dig into this deeper. Um, all right, so so why does that matter to you? So, so what? Uh, well, my apartment might catch on fire and I'll lose everything. Others will get hurt. Well, and uh, what what's distressing about that. I'm not trying to minimize that that would be really bad, but um, is that is that the worst thing or is there something behind that? Well, that would be irresponsible. Like I could have controlled it, uh, could have been, or I am responsible for it. Okay, um, what about that responsibility is scary? Um, well, this is evidence that I'm a bad person, you know, I'll probably end up in jail, uh, in maybe morally, spiritually, like I, I've just totally missed it. Um, I'm going to go to hell. Um, very interesting. Wait, what? Where did the go to hell come from? Well, sometimes when we talk about things as simple as a checking behavior and we actually address the core fear, we discover that there's a lot of scrupulosity or religiosity in an obsession in those compulsions. And all of a sudden, the exposures that we've done uh, or do need to actually change and morph around that core fear because otherwise we're just going to be putting out all these random fires. The core fear unifies treatment and you can call it the core disgust or the core distress or the core avoidance, whatever, because um, it's not just fear, but it helps unify a treatment. So, okay, now we're going to be looking out for other potential obsessions that deal with this uh, catastrophic ruin. Um, and, uh, oh, I am noticing that my power is looking like it is running out. Bear with me one second. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. 
leaning into some of the uncertainty and my own uh, perfectionism of things going perfectly. Well, there you go. All right. So with the core fear, core fear is so essential to unify treatment and get us focused on the right paths. We're not putting out all these random fires. Uh, doing it uh, ultimately helps us to uh, simplify the things that we're facing uh, and also direct us to. Okay, client's fear of distress, the next pitfall. Huge, huge, huge. Um, these all are really big areas. That's why we're covering them and some of the most common areas. Uh, this one could be the top three, top five that I see, at least as a clinician. So fear reduction can be problematic. Everyone who comes into treatment, of course, wants to feel better, reduce fear, um, experience uh, change in a number of ways. But though it's a fine long-term goal, anything in the moments that we set up for ourselves uh, as an avoidance of fear reinforces fear. It's how uh, fear works. It's how learning around uh, fear, how we acquire fear, uh, or how we learn differently. The school of thought called inhibitory learning looks into how we might uh, change our learning about something, which is essential uh, to, to appreciate when we are trying to understand how we grow um, in the context of getting away from fear, that we don't always have to be stuck. We can learn differently. Uh, so this is where, when doing exposures proper, pairing it with relaxation training can actually be contraindicated. And uh, this is not meant to be offensive to anybody who's doing that, but it needs to be assessed, first of all. Um, now, I'll say this, the clients who have panic attacks, we're going to have to do uh, the deep breathing practice and relaxation, and also those who have comorbid generalized anxiety disorder, muscle relaxation oftentimes is really huge and indicated. But in the context of exposures, we want to learn to face a fear head on without tricks, without anything that prevents us from learning. Was I able to face this thing? So if I realize that my checking is getting out of control for the stove, or my reassurance seeking is getting out of control for my relationship, or dot, 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 and many examples that you're gonna to hear tonight. Well, uh, it, it's fine to desire to feel less stressed, but if you set yourself up to seek less distress, well, I'll tell you what'll do that usually initially, that's the compulsion, but the compulsion reinforces the obsessions, which reinforces the distress that the person feels, more compulsions, disorder continues. Um, so we don't want to set ourselves up for failure by setting up the goal of that. We want to set up the goal as uh, any number of things, like uh, being able to get one's life back to, regardless of fear, to face situations and to do so in a present way or a mindful way, or uh, to be more present with family, to be able to go on vacation and not have a panic attack or dot, dot, dot. Uh, all examples of the things that I hear as far as goals. Um, so they're hard to swallow pills, right? Exposure and response prevention. So you're saying that I've got to face this fear and no fear reduction? Well, at least sequentially over time, we might not be able to do it all in one fell swoop. And in fact, the treatment itself is built around the reality that we as human beings can only do so much. So this is why having a team member to walk with you in the process is so essential. Okay. So tolerating distress. There's a lot of helps for this. Learning about it. I just talked about inhibitory learning. Sometimes it helps to know potential underlying mechanisms of fear, uh, how we acquire fear, uh, how we break these fearful processes, uh, and going beyond fear, how disgust works. That's a whole separate thing. It's also connected. Uh, te teaching skills to sit with distress. That's big. Uh, that's a important one. So acceptance and commitments therapy act um, teaches acceptance skills, which is not, uh, oh, great, I am welcoming catastrophe in my life. It's the acceptance of reality saying, okay, I have to face this. I am facing it. 
sticking with one's commitments, uh, identifying and sticking with one's values, and distress tolerance. All right, so other adjuncts to bolster the treatments, you might do some dialectical behavior therapy, uh, which incorporates as well a lot of mindfulness and motion regulation. I use a lot of motivational interviewing, done a lot in addictions as well. Uh, my initial specialization for the first uh, several years in private practice was addiction uh, until this became my love. So uh, utilizing those motivational interviewing tools helps people come in contact with what, what do you actually care about? Intrinsic motivation. Uh, family therapy work oftentimes is essential, especially if there's a lot of accommodation or a sufferer who's at home. Uh, and let's be honest, every family is going to have accommodation at some point. In the research, it's really high as far as the numbers. Um, support groups, reading podcasts, the OCD stories, books, Jonathan Grayson's uh, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. You can go to my website. I have a bookshelf. I have podcasts. I'm on the OCD stories podcast. Um, lots of different things can really help. So <laughs> bad luck, Brian. For those of you that are familiar with memes, it's one of my favorites. Um, poor guy. He was just at an awkward phase in those teenage years with braces. He tried the acceptance, but he couldn't accept it. Oh, wah, wah. Oh, man. I'm a nerd, right? Okay, so why do some people write EXRP and others write ERP? Again, you can feel free to put it up in the comments. This is a more technical question that <laughs> uh, when I was working with a few of the therapists recently, they were more interested, but my audience tonight, uh, probably being only a few therapists, might be less so. Uh, the reality is that it's interchangeable. So. Uh, ERP has its roots um, in behavioral psychology with Vic Meyer, 50s, 60s. And advances led to saying EXRP with Edna Foa in the 80s, but by and large, it switched back. All right. Compulsive behaviors and rituals. So this is that uh, next subset categorically of common pitfalls. Um, you know what? I've got a question here. I'm going to go ahead and pop this up. So... <sighs> With ERP, how does it work for fears around death? Um, Julie had asked this and forwarded it uh, through my website. So, yeah, so just curious about what exposure would look like in that scenario. Uh, so first of all, assessment, assessment, assessment um, is key for both the provider, for a client, the sufferer to say, okay, where, how does this come up? track it, to monitor it. When does it come up? Uh, in what ways do I try to respond? Um, the core fear, going back to that, is going to be big. Fears around death can really range the gamut. Um, so the obsession could be a fear around death with hidden run OCD. Um, what if that bump that I just followed, I know it's a speed bump, but I, can't, I need to be sure. Uh, it could be that. It could be fear of one's own death or causing death. It could link to superstitious compulsions, such as if I don't tap this a certain number of times, uh, what, what if somebody dies because they have a thought paired with it at the same time? Most OCD sufferers know it's illogical and yet struggle with that so much. So first of all, it's going to be about what are those thoughts and then what are the responses? Do you have to tap several times, a number of times to feel okay? Does something have to be just right? Do you have to say a prayer? Etc. So we're going to assess it. We're going to catch all of the different major compulsions and address some of the key thoughts. Look at the core fear. Um, let's say it's a core fear of um, I am going to be negligent and will have been responsible for killing someone. I will have driven away and the police are going to find me. I'm going to end up in jail. My life is going to be ruined. A ruinous core fear. Uh, and so exposure is going to have to work around the specifics that if maybe a person's avoided driving. Walmart is a common place. Lots of speed bumps, lots of people that folks avoid uh, going to grocery stores, things like that. Um, driving, period. Um, hit and run OCD can lead to that severe impairment. So the person just hangs their keys on the actual hook and says, no more, I can't do it. And so, yeah, sure, at some point we may want that person to be driving again on the hierarchy, but there's no way they're going to jump from zero to 10 uh, in the first session. So we might actually start with some imaginal exposures so, of uh, watching a video of somebody driving a car. Uh, we might deal with some imaginal scripts like writing down the obsession and the in 
envisioned a bad thing. Uh, and it has to be strategic and sustainable. So it's a great question. And if you want to follow up with any of that, feel free to uh, put any more details here in the comments as well. Okay, so compulsions are sneaky. We've got to catch them all. <laughs> Fun show. All right, so the solution to uh, compulsion. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I totally skipped the slide there. Uh, the pitfall of mental compulsions. Um, so I hear from clients that there are still psychiatrists and other providers who are still saying, by and large, the treatment is effective for overt compulsions, the checking, the washing, et cetera, but is not as effective for mental rituals. Where in the world is that coming from? I mean, back in the day, that was definitely a thought early on, and it's now at least at a minimum a misnomer. Um, but that's completely false. Um, so uh, Puro is a reference to those who uh, have the experience of what appears to be more purely obsessional, aka everything appears to be um, more in their thoughts, in their head, um, and it's just as real. So um, a lot of those themes would be of the religious, spiritual nature, a lot of harm-based thoughts, a lot of uh, intrusive, sexual, violent thoughts, graphic thoughts uh, passing through a person's mind. So. Uh, graphic violent thoughts, for example, a person just walking along and they get this intrusion of, of bothered, horrified that why am I getting this thought and wanting to look it up? Am I psychotic? Am I wanting to harm somebody else? Well, by the way, right away there, looking it up is a physical, tangible compulsion. It's, it's checking um, in the context of OCD. Um, and so compulsions are compulsions are compulsions. Uh, they decrease distress um, in getting reassurance, avoidance, or, or ways that it can feel like it decreases that distress, but momentarily it reinforces the cycle because the person never learns that they were able to face that fearful thing. So lots of examples of compulsing from an, a mental standpoint, praying, counting, analyzing, figuring it out, neutralizing uh, recently, by the way, thought suppression, been um, thinking about that one a lot, I'm gonna write an article upcoming, checking, scanning, scanning for body sensations, emotions, memorizing, undoing, a lot of different ways. Yes, compulsions are sneaky. We have to catch them all. So no mental compulsions, uh, ideally. Now, this is not being perfect. This is also not thought stopping because the initial thought, potato. All right, you just thought potato, right? Classic example, don't think of the pink elephant. Classic example, We're gonna think about that thing. So. That's, that's not the point. It's not to block the intrusion. It's to block the compulsive response, reaction. We're not going to do it perfect immediately. We're never going to do it perfect. Um, but to be able to consistently, persistently take one swing of the ax at the tree that you're trying to cut down. And if you do one swing of the ax and say, wow, that was really hard. This tree is really big and move on. That's all you'll have, but if you do it every single day, one swing of the ax or two or three or four or five swings, at some point that tree's coming down. Um, big, big deal. Um, so with no mental compulsions, we always wanna help clients to be open to the possibility that some sort of covert compulsion might be lurking without terrifying them that there's always something more where we as therapists need to be careful that we're not adding to the fear uh, with that. But to, especially if a few things aren't happening. So if a client um, isn't gaining some confidence or they're not feeling mastery over a certain area, um, distress is not how we determine success per se, but if a person is not habituating, we say, it at least begs some questions. So over time, if a person's been facing a situation and not, they're not habituating, habituation is a natural physical Reality, it's a physical principle. We will never feel exactly the same way about one thing forever and ever and ever. Um, so these are clues and tips to the sufferer and also the clinician to maybe ask some questions. Like, okay, well, you said that you have been driving your car. You said that you've been going back to church instead of avoiding it. You said dot, dot, dot. But you say that also you feel really startled. Um, each time the topic is brought up and you're distressed. Um, 
Do you have any mental rituals? Just a suggestion to dig into that can really, really help. Um, and oftentimes we'll find that, oh, well, yeah, I've been thinking ahead and what's this going to look like in the next step and the next exposure that I have and so on and so forth. Uh, so to make exposures effective, we also want to do what's called context variability. Um, this is where we mix up the context. We want to um, possibly have to be careful, work with some competing responses like is used with BFRBs, ticks, etc. Um, and imaginal scripts. And I also have a, a comment here. I'm going to pop up at this point. Um, I'm so hyper focused on not doing compulsions. The compulsions themselves become the obsessions, trying to be perfect and keep my distance from them. How would ERP work with this scenario? Okay, um, good. So, great question. And of course, without being able to sit down and do a full assessment, this is going to be limited and educational. Um, any of the hyper focused obsessions, uh, somatic OCD, is really significant for this, where a person is so focused on something like breathing or uh, a typically a natural bodily process, heart beating, et cetera, uh, that they spend, they, they feel like if they don't focus on it or do something a certain way, their heart could stop, they won't breathe right, uh, they could choke, they could lose air, uh, and it's just miserable. Somatic OCD, um, it's, uh, it involves a lot of, um, if you will, hyper focus on those symptoms. So a lot of people get really nervous when they think about exposure for something like that um, because the thought is, I, I don't need more of this. Well, actually, usually based on assessment, it's actually less focused, right? Or it will be less focused because if I'm, uh, if the obsession is I must pay attention to my breathing um, or else something bad could happen or I won't take good breaths or I could die, that's obviously a lot of pressure that the person feels. And then the compulsion is going to be to focus, right? To breathe in a certain way, to so on and so forth. Well, we're going to work on not actually um, putting one's attention on those details. And uh, it's going to involve typically a lot of mindfulness, uh, a lot of focus on the present moment. Uh, and so uh, to use that by example, that is one of the subtypes and the themes of OCD that we do that in a major way. So. Let's just say that you're doing that maybe in a minor kind of subset of other exposures that you're doing. Well, if uh, the compulsion um, kind of becomes the obsession, if you're trying to be perfect and keep distance from them, you're going to have to assess that further. You're going to have to look at it and uh, say, okay, what do I do? Uh, what am I doing in trying to be perfect and keeping my distance from them? So right there, is there some avoidance? Uh, that's going on? Uh, are there some mindfulness skills that need to be developed to be able to sit with that? And then when the thoughts run away, I got to do this a certain way, okay. Um, there might be some obsessions on just right, perfectionistic obsessions. Uh, so to be able to address that is going to be really, really important. So assess it, track it. Um, and I know you're saying that that's part of the problem, but if you need help, obviously a specialist, a clinician, um, and even if it's just that listening friend at first that uh, can help not to give reassurance, but help to help you identify, okay, how am I compulsing with this? Oh, I'm not just staying present with this, okay? So maybe working on that is the actual exposure because of the urge to do the compulsion perfectly. So I hope I answered that in a helpful way. Um, great, y'all are doing a good job answering these questions, or uh, asking questions in the comments. Keep it up. Uh, I'll save a little bit of time towards the end, but if we do it throughout, that's cool. So next pitfall I'm going to jump into. Everybody doing good? Need to get some water? Want to get some dinner? Whatever you want to do, take me with you. Pop it up on the smartphone or uh, put it up on your TV, whatever. This will be recorded um, for viewing later as well. Okay, so providing reassurance. Big, 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 big deal, especially from a family and relationship standpoint. Um, reassurance is in OC, it, well, in OCD, it goes beyond normative reassurance. It is this persistent reassurance seeking. It's where a person has already gotten the answer or already has a pretty good idea of the answer, but it's not sitting right. 
But if we look at the Oxford Dictionary definition of reassurance, an attempt to remove doubts or fears through comments or action. And there's nothing wrong with that. As a, an OCD clinician, I typically teach my clients to think in terms of um, uh, assurance versus reassurance. Um, so in, in a long-term love relationship, um, my marriage with my wife, I want to hear that she loves me. Now, asking her, do you love me every single day is that first of all, that's not going to fly with my wife, <laughs> which is good. Uh, but um, that, that would start to be pathological. Um, and so the reassurance to alleviate some distress that's boiling under the surface, that can actually be for a lot of reasons. Um, in some of the couples training that I've done uh, in, in certain relationship patterns that can come up outside of OCD, but in OCD, that reassurance seeking as a compulsion has to be addressed. Uh, because if we have to catch all the compulsions and over time begin to stop them, then yep, reassurance seeking, you gotta do it. So most patients involve others in reassurance. It feels like it helps them manage uncertainty. And those with sexual and religious obsessions are most likely to seek it. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work right now on the faith and OCD task force with the IOCDF and uh, some great stuff is going on. Uh, we just launched a, a page, the IOCDF rather, just launched a, a page uh, dedicated to um, uh, those in, in different faith communities. It's diverse um, to, uh, to get support. And we're working on resources and ways that we can uh, reach out to uh, clergy, and in therapy, many times we can actually involve family, but it's a little less of a straight line to be able to meet with a clergy member, for example. Um, so no matter how we do it, we want to separate out helpful, healthy assurance versus reassurance. Um, in, in not providing reassurance, uh, we don't want to feed that beast we've already talked about compulsions reinforce the disorder. So <laughs> does this obsessional content mean it doesn't matter what you, the obsession says? Uh, for those of you that are old enough to remember The Rock when he <laughs> did his thing, it doesn't matter. Um, most people also think exposure therapists are just going to interrupt him like this. Some might. Uh, Reed Wilson, <laughs> he'll interrupt as well. Uh, I'll usually let a person finish their sentence, but sometimes I interrupt part of the job. Uh, it's not getting stuck in the obsessional content. If you're stuck in the content, uh, you're stuck in the obsession, which is, interestingly enough, part of the compulsion. Okay? So it's oftentimes counterintuitive. Um, pretty much every family member is going to give it at some point. Try to logic out the OCD just like the sufferer. Um, and we many times have to at least train a client how to teach others around them um, that one, they're changing their own behavior, the client, but two, they might uh, ask a trusted loved one for some help. They say, hey, could you help me with this? Could you help me with an exposure, which is the support side, or hey, next time I ask you for reassurance in this way, would you not give it and remind me that I ask you? <laughs> okay, they might be a little nervous at first, like you're going to be upset or stressed, and, Maybe, but when you're actually at that place and you're doing it hierarchically, systematically, step by step, um, as part of the plan, it's not one fell swoop. You don't have to do everything in one day, but making strides, um, it makes a difference. It makes a change. And one of the big ways that compulsions continue to exist is, of course, through reassurance. Okay, a free resource from the uh, Anxiety Disorder Center from the St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute is the um, distinguishing information seeking and reassurance seeking. You can get it straight from them or go to my OCD page where I have this and a ton of other free resources. If you download uh, this also free again um, uh, presentation, you will have the opportunity to um, get these resources too directly. So I'll just put that banner on there as a reminder. Okay. Uh, distraction. I already commented on this. Uh, a lot of folks mm, 
have some mixed feelings about this. Uh, this one might be one of the ones that creates the most tension discussion-wise in the therapeutic community. Uh, I feel like clients actually, once they have a rationale, most of the time are cool <laughs> with this. They, they get it, they understand it. But sometimes it doesn't make sense. And sometimes uh, clients have some other reasons that they think about uh, that they may need distraction for. And here's the thing, I am here as a clinician to assess and to listen. I grow as a clinician. Therapy is better and more effective when you have a clinician who's listening and on your side. Um, and so I don't want to just come in guns blazing and say, you must face this terrible thing that's awful. And you say you don't want to do it, but you need to do it like a drill sergeant. Uh, no distraction, nothing. No, no. We're going to assess it. We're going to look at this. Um, and in the end, it's about the client coming to terms with these things. I will never force a single thing on a person. Uh, I will push and challenge um, different exposures when it's appropriate, when the client has given me their consent to do so. But it is all about clients personalizing this. So staying present, uh, if this can ultimately be, if distraction can be a compulsion or one of the ways that interrupts fear disconfirmation, we got to figure out ways to not do that. Let me comment on the fear uh, disconfirmation, and I'll pop over to uh, this slide as well, the self-efficacy interference here. Um, there's a mixed message that distraction creates. If I have some terrible, awful, well, if I have what we call in the OCD world a thought, because thoughts are thoughts, but if I label it as terrible and awful because I get some thought that appears to be blasphemous, or uh, violence, or sexually inappropriate, uh, aside from my values, and I do the exposure. Sometimes there is an exposure, an unplanned one, in the first session with a lot of clients by just saying, I have these types of obsessions. I'm so proud of you all who have done this, clients, and just anyone else listening to this because it is way harder than I can even give you credit for um, just coming to the first therapy session oftentimes. Um, so you're facing a fear by just saying, I have this thought that's scary and a lot of clients are afraid they'll be arrested on the spot, turned into CPS, uh, cops called, fill in the blank, um, which are some of those core fears. And uh, we do a core fear conceptualization, we're gonna catch some of that. So distraction gives this mixed message. Um, if I only get to the point where I can verbalize to a person, uh, yeah, sometimes I have these sexual intrusions and I, I don't know what to do about it. Okay, I got that out, great. Okay, so you've jumped the hurdle of not avoiding talking about it. That's an exposure. Um, maybe that's a level one, two, three, four. Maybe that feels like a 10 on your hierarchy. But uh, if you don't go further, and cut out those more subtle things, reassurance seeking, right? If you get one out of the blue and then you check with a friend, maybe you check with a different friend that you've never talked to. Hey, do you ever get these thoughts sometimes? Well, subtle compulsion. Um, or the thought comes up and you're like, oh, this is so uncomfortable. I, I need to listen to music. Again, no judgment, no shame. That's the first thing that I'd want to do too. Um, but we still have to address it uh, because it can create this um, self-efficacy interference or it gets in the way uh, in clinical terms of fear disconfirmation. So you don't really know, your brain doesn't yet know that you actually got over that fear by facing it. Um, you don't know that you've really overcome that fear. You know that you kind of stepped into, oh, okay, well, your brain may have another reason. Like, I have this caring therapist. That's why they were so receptive. But other people? So we have to go as far as the obsession wants to push a person to go. Hopefully that makes sense. So one of my favorite quotes from many research articles that have scoured in the past several years, um, and this one is my single favorite one that the presentation pulls a lot from, 
the goal of exposure in exposure and response prevention is to face the obsession provoking stimuli head on without tricks or subtle forms of avoidance. Exposure works better when patients focus their attention on the feared stimulus rather than distracting themselves during exposure. You might not be there immediately, but can you get there over time? I bet you can. All right, so the last big category, so kind of three categories that all these different pitfalls fall under, treatment plan or treatment planning pitfalls and solutions. Trivia, what is the number one reason that treatment fails? Treatment non-adherence, not utilizing ACT, seeing a therapist from Oklahoma instead of Texas. <laughs> what? You're going to rag on Oklahoma a little bit. I have family up there, but we're pretty proud of Texas. Uh, or treatment, it doesn't. Treatment doesn't fail ever. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We got an answer. Yep. Thanks, Nate. Treatment non adherence. So it's not even necessarily the treatment itself um, that is problematic, but treatments non adherence, where there have to be a lot of components that happen. There's a simplicity to it, but there's a complexity to it as well. So a person can't just attend therapy. There has to be practice in between sessions. Um, and I would venture to say that in most cases, if even if a person did 50 therapy sessions, um, with OCD, because of its persistence and recurrence, chronic and or episodic nature, um, a person's got to do the work in between. Um, technically speaking, that's the most important thing long term. Um, but of course, therapy may be for a day or a week or months or, or years uh, in some severe cases, uh, be a huge part of that. We've got to do the things that make the treatment effective. Common pitfalls is all about, hey, if we're not doing the stuff that's already on paper, we've already studied these things, we know it. Uh, if we're not doing that, then we haven't really given it a fair shake. Um, so we want to dig into it. We want to assess it. No shame, no judgment. If you have OCD, you have one of the most disabling, literally, conditions on the face of this planet. The World Health Organization has rated it as a top 10 again and again and again. That's over cancer. Y'all, really? Oh my goodness. Seriously? Yeah. It causes more disability impairments. So having to step away from school, going on leave for a job, etc. Pretty wild. So give yourself a break. Be gracious. Um, but if you find a barrier, we got to assess it. Is it too hard, too aversive? Is it maybe the personality of the clinician? Sometimes you have to talk about those things too. <laughs> yeah, I just feel attacked or whatever. Treatment ambivalence, lack of faith it'll work, uh, etc. We want to assess these things. And again, with a good, trustworthy clinician support, you can start to look at these things. Um, all right, so be honest with your provider. Uh, never, never, never do that. Okay, so pitfall number whatever this is, <laughs> um, not going far enough. How much OCD do you get rid of? Well, this can sound scary, when you're at the front side of the journey, we have to get rid of all compulsions, all rituals, all avoidance um, systematically. It's not perfection. It doesn't mean that you won't have a lapse for a moment or a day or even sometimes a week. Um, but effectively in therapy, we know from also the research that if you don't take it as far as addressing every single compulsive process in therapy, the person is way more likely to relapse. So untreated areas, such as, um, normally just pick one that I haven't talked about uh, tonight. How about, ah, um, intrusive sounds, 
and meaningless sounds, superstitious rituals. Sometimes people forget to bring these up or don't want to, or it feels awkward. If I don't sit a certain way until I feel a certain way, I feel like something bad could happen or it just feels awkward. Um, uh, sometimes I feel like there's a screaming in my head and I don't know what to do about that. Um, you might just write that off and be like, oh, no big deal, whatever. Um, but if you have some compulsions around it, it's still maintaining the OCD around it. And if you're maintaining the OCD, we use the analogy of cancer. Um, uh, we have to get rid of it all. We can't leave cancer cells um, around the original uh, area that's being treated, or it's going to grow back. All of it. Terminate compulsions. Awful Arnold Schwarzenegger right now. So... Realistically, all rituals are often not addressed in therapy. Um, it's not a perfectionism thing, um, but it could be a lot of reasons, sometimes early termination, feeling better. Um, I, by the way, check out my 11 considerations um, before stopping therapy, an article that I wrote just this year. And so, so many reasons. And I get it. I, I do think personally, um, this isn't studied just personally, that feeling better is um, one of the biggest uh, why people move on. Uh, could be cost. Um, feels like it is getting expensive, especially as most OCD specialists are not on insurance. Um, and the, uh, the, the nature of it, sometimes it might be expensive. The accessibility could be tricky. You might be driving a long ways. I have clients who drive far for appointments. Um, it's lot of reasons, but let's assess it and in the end not let the OCD infection spread. You want to go far enough. Gentle confidence goes a long way on behalf of the provider and also the patient and family members. Um, I believe you can do this. Let's just look at the thing that's in front of us. Um, utilizing ACT, motivational interviewing, again, some helps. Those moments, do I go to that next level? Sometimes it can truly feel like this, a level five to level six exposure. And sometimes, too, those level one, two, three, I have clients that they've lived with them so long, it's, it's very weird that some clients will struggle with more avoidance and resistance towards the lower level exposures um, changing memories. Okay, so we talked about reassurance. I've talked a little bit about family accommodation. Major pitfall is not working with significant others and family. 90% of the time with my clients, I'm going to recommend um, at least bringing a spouse, significant other, family member into the process. I don't care what the age of the person is. I mean, uh, you can be, uh, I see teens on up, so you can be 13 to uh, 90. I'm still going to find a way, if possible, to, to recommend. <laughs> and not everybody has to. Um, but it's typically most helpful to do that. Back to the clergy piece as well. Uh, or if there's someone else that's a really key part of your life. I have people, uh, uh, this might sound silly, but if you're in a book club um, or your, your closest friends, where are they? Would you ever think of pulling that person into a session? If that's the roommate that you're living with and they see these things and they want to help and they don't know how to help. Um, but it's a little bit of a digression from the core of whether it's family or just support in general. Uh, what's known as family accommodation, this is studied pretty extensively too. There's a lot of great books out there, articles uh, on this. Um, well, it's strongly associated with symptom severity, especially for kids, family accommodation, and then it impairs family's quality of life too. And so it's, uh, it's a big mistake not working with the family when you can. Um, and there can be reasons not to, for sure. Um, so we want to, we wanna get in some education where we can and maybe hierarchically think of those ways. Actually, when we think of cutting out accommodation, so if a family member is helping alleviate uh, someone's distress by getting a response, reassurance response, et cetera, well, um, then how do we sequentially get rid of that? You might be able to just pull that's one example out immediately. But some things might be a little bit harder, especially someone who has a lot of rituals, someone with a high level of severity. We're going to have to be even more intentional and more planned with 
those things. Back to the you've got it, I believe in you, you can do hard things. Kimberly Quinlan, California, uh, beautiful day to do hard things. Um, supportive parenting equals acceptance plus confidence in the child. And frankly, these are some of the same skills that we use as therapists to impart in clients that they can do it. <laughs> it's, it's such a joy to impart that and also to be able to see when these things start to click. Um, I have a free guide that I put together, a uh, fancy, colorful uh, guide with all the basics of family accommodation. Uh, feel free to go to my website to check it out, or if you've downloaded this presentation, just the hyperlink there. Okay, so another pitfall. Y'all still with me? I'm slightly over an hour in. <laughs> We're gonna to get to the Q&A at the very end still, but again, questions have been great throughout. All right, so another pitfall is the wrong form of exposure. I say that there's four types of exposure. Some people are gonna say three, fine. I'm not gonna die on that hill. But um, in vivo is situational. So if you've been avoiding driving, you're gonna to need to drive. You can't just do it in your head. Um, imaginal. Uh, would be if you have a fear of um, uh, doing something uh, from religious violation standpoint. So for Christians, a common one that comes up is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit um, or uh, a holiday or food observance uh, for Jewish clients, uh, etc. We aren't going to be able to access some core fears if the core fear, uh, or excuse me, we're not going to be able to access it as well face value if it's mostly mental or if the core fear centers around something that you can't necessarily do or test or you wouldn't want to. So the thing about situational exposures with touching a doorknob, for example, sitting with that, not washing, um, or uh, not checking the stove before bedtime or something like that. Uh, that has to be in vivo. We might use some imaginal with it, but when it comes to uh, what if uh, what if I've offended God? Uh, what if I go to hell? I, we're, <laughs> don't worry, as exposure therapists, we don't prescribe those things. We're not like, okay, great. Well, let's go ahead and just totally violate your values and beliefs and everything that you live for and do an exposure this way. If an exposure therapist does that, if they're actually trying to violate your values, they, they're not doing proper assessment. Um, and so you need to, or maybe they don't have all the information. Maybe you haven't shared with them the full story. Uh, and so it has to be collaborative, communicative. Uh, if we as a therapist miss something, you gotta tell us. We're not mind readers, despite the fact that we're <laughs> in therapy as therapists. Uh, so you gotta talk through these things. Back to the four types, in vivo, imaginal. Interoceptive is for sensations, especially useful for panic attacks. Um, it's also very useful for many of the obsessions, uh, sexual obsessions as well. Um, if a person uh, has an intrusive, unwanted, um, violent sexual obsession and they notice that they're starting to sweat as they do that, um, given that person sweating uh, while reading an imaginal script, I had this thought, which by the way, we're not just trying to stir up a bunch of uncomfortable stuff for no reason. We work with what we have. And so we take that. Um, so maybe it's a, a thought that a client has on incest. They have this intrusive unwanted thought that's just pounding in their head and they are afraid, oh my goodness, I just thought, did, did I want to have sex with this family member? Well. Uh, oh gosh, what does this mean about me? All the compulsions start to go in. And if the person starts to sweat and the person feels a hot flush over their body, they may also start to interpret that as some sort of sexual cue. Um, oh, well, I'm sweating, I'm, I'm flushing, and so forth. Uh, so interoceptive exposure is actually going to um, work with the sensations that feel uncomfortable, learning to face those and to not pair it with um, both, of course, the catastrophic thought uh, with that, but uh, most importantly, the compulsion. 
Virtual reality, by the way, uh, this helps a lot. It's really essential for some things like phobias, like flying phobia. Um, you almost have to do virtual reality these days um, until you can get on the plane to step up the hierarchy. Uh, but there's other ways with virtual reality that you can really, really do some effective ERP for OCD too. Um, so in vivo, when you can do it situational, that is the best and the strongest, unless if there's something that has to be done, uh, imagine it. So pair the right exposure for the obsession you are treating. It's like wine and cheese pairing, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> uh, not that I'm really good at that. But um, let's here's some of the examples. If, if you're running somebody over with your car, probably in vivo and imaginal both. Obsession that you're a pedophile. Well, there could be some in vivo for avoidances, like if you have avoided being at parks. Um, but there's going to be mostly imaginal. Fear of snapping and killing someone, that's almost completely imaginal most of the time, unless if there's just something like a place that you're avoiding. Uh, sickness related to touching items in the grocery store, and that's going to be mostly uh, in vivo. So you can still pair both with success. Okay, so I think we've talked through that enough. In vivo, when you need imaginal, these aren't the exposures you are looking for. All right. So pitfall, again, unrealistic expectations. Want to does not equal ready to. Um, so we as clinicians can move too quickly and not do the best work. I've been saying recently that how we do exposures is actually more important than what we do in exposure. And bear with me. Some people will be like, wait, what, what do you mean? Because but I want to be free to go to this place or do this thing or the thing that I've been avoiding. I hear you. Uh, as far as life impairments and life moving forward, yes, like to take some steps and actions are really important for that. But OCD proper, it is about changing our relationship to anxiety, fear, uncertainty. Jonathan Grayson believes that OCD is a disorder of uncertainty. Many agree. I, I tend to agree. He's, the man. Um, but whatever we say it is, it's about changing our relationship to that. Um, and so if we move too quickly and a person burns out, uh, feels like they've done the therapy because they checked off the box that the therapist told them to do, but they were suppressing, they were white knuckling, they were ruminating during exposures, they went home and they undid them all. That, that's, that's not it. It's the exposure with response prevention. We have to learn how to do this and keep doing it. I bet you could go to the gym. Most people could probably go to the gym today and do some huge amount, at least for you. Like I could probably go right now, I don't know, uh, and uh, lift something way greater. I could probably bench press 300, right? If my life depended upon it, I don't bench press and that would be really dangerous. But if I did that, I'd probably injure myself. Can I do that consistently? Yeah, absolutely not. Um, again, probably get injured, but if my child were stuck <laughs> in a place in an emergency, I could probably do some pretty crazy things. That is not what we're trying to set up. We're trying to set up sustainability, support, encouragement, confidence building, mastery. Y'all getting the feel of this? <laughs> so sometimes when we're waiting on habituations, feeling significantly less distress, less anxiety. Sometimes it feels like that when we're waiting. Okay, so part of unrealistic expectations too, failing to understand what's called the extinction burst. Um, ERP is making my symptoms worse. ERP doesn't work for me. I tried it once and it's not for me. Well, um, any of you who have kids will understand extinction burst implicitly. You tell your child no with something that they really want and they really love. That's it, right? That's all you have to do. Sweet. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> the child, uh, maybe not every situation, but at some point will get louder and louder and more intense. And a temper tantrum could come up or any number of things. Well, in all of human behavior, the extinction burst can exist as well. And it's no different with exposure and response prevention. 
but you're trying to do some big things and you're intentionally facing some fears, it's going to be tiring. And a lot of times I will tell clients to practice some uh, grace applied, some uh, self-compassion by at the end of a session, go get, go get yourself a treat. Maybe it's, maybe it's an ice cream. <laughs> maybe it's just a few quiet moments away from the family just to sit and do some breathing, whatever it is. Um, so the extinction burst uh, is where the OCD gets angry. It gets mad <laughs> in a sense. Uh, neuroscientists would absolutely hate how I describe this so creatively, <laughs> but there it is nonetheless. Um, so appreciate it, but it's going to get louder or try to get louder before it gets better. Okay, so let's go ahead and work on the realistic expectations, pacing of the ERP. I already talked about some of these things. Uh, goal number one, tolerate distress without compulsing or face your fear without compulsing not eliminating distress, because you're still going to have distress. I mean, technically speaking, if you want to be comatose the rest of your life and not feel anything, that's, unfortunately, there, that can happen with uh, <laughs> uh, blah, blah, blah. I suppose if a person um, was given a sedative the rest of their life at a super high dosage, like Haldol, um, like portrayed in the movies, um, by the way, uh, one of the biggest misnomers of psychiatry, right, is what the movies portray. Uh, so a person getting a butt shot of Haldol and, oh, let's just knock them out. Well, technically speaking, yes, there are drugs, there are medications that can knock a person out, so to speak, so they don't feel anxiety. But that's not what, that's not what clients want. Um, at least the ones that I come across. They want life change. They want to get back to things or recover something that they never had in the first place. So... Let's not set ourselves up for failure to eliminate all the stress. Let's learn to face it. Let's learn to step into it. Let's learn to focus on the thing that's important and that we value and that we believe and we, uh, we uh, would do the work for. And surprise, surprise, we're going to have a lot more motivation with that as well. Okay, so understand the expect the extinction burst and change that relationship with discomfort. You've got to change. Okay. I'm going to keep going here just for time. You can go through these slides on your own if you'd like. Uh, trivia, what percentage of OCD sufferers have at least one other diagnosis or comorbid? Okay. Well, it looks like I will uh, post this uh, myself. Hey, I got the answer right. Do I get a surprise? <laughs> uh, I don't know if you would expect this number, but, oh, I didn't have my fancy pop up. 90%! What? Yep. So comorbidity is common. Um, you might be asking, what is comorbidity? It's when at least two disorders coexist. Um, so in the addiction world, oftentimes it's called co-occurring if there's an addiction in mental health. Uh, but just general mental health is, uh, we say comorbidity. So um, depression, other anxiety disorders being the most common. Uh, but others too. I mean, it runs the whole gamut, PTSD, et cetera. Uh, it can um, slow down treatments or um, uh, make it a little trickier, a little more complex, depending on what's going on. Uh, if there's a detour, like uh, substance abuse, um, so yeah, almost 25%, uh, up to 25%, uh, of OCD sufferers will abuse a substance at some point. It really kind of makes sense to me um, with all the suffering that exists in OCD. Um, but I work with a lot of clients where it doesn't become a detour. Um, they start to work on the OCD and start to feel better and they're able to easily, more easily manage uh, substance use, abuse. Most commonly, alcohol sedatives in my experience, right? Calm down the brain. I don't have a lot of clients with OCD who are using the stimulants because uh, they feel even more miserable, um, but not necessarily always the case. So these comorbid conditions can slow down the process. Unless we address them, bring them in, they don't have to. And this is where assessment is really key. And this is where getting a uh, specialist on your side can make a difference. I'm not here to just fanboy therapy. My end goal of this is not just do therapy, do therapy. I need more clients, need more clients. I, I'm going to be busy the rest of my life doing whatever I do. There is enough 
stuff to help people. Um, but I just want you to, uh, if you're at a spot where you're already serious about these things and um, getting help and getting support, way to go. Proud of you. And if you're just learning for the first time, way to go. That is a huge deal. Um, so proud of you ultimately. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's take this thing seriously though. What do clinicians treat first? A question of first order. Well, we're going to assess risk, acuity. So of course, someone who uh, is actively suicidal, um, who actually wishes in the egocentric way that they were dead, uh, we've got to address that. And you've got to address it first. It's a, an issue of acuity. Now, a lot of y'all will have obsessions on suicide. And again, a reason for a specialist, a reason for separating this out in assessment is separating out, okay, is this ego dystonic? Is this against my typical wishes and how people understand me, know me? Or is this ego syntonic? Is this synonymous? So ego syntonic suicidal ideations would be the person if you ask a question, like, hey, tell me about these suicidal thoughts. Yeah, I just wish I weren't here anymore. I, um, really just wish I were dead. I don't know what my purpose is. That would be um, the, if there's uh, just the desire behind that, and especially if there's a consistency to that, it's good evidence. It's egocentonic. With ego dystonic, it's going to be, could I be suicidal? What if I did? I have been suicidal before. Well, I've had suicidal thoughts. Notice the difference, right? Asking these what if questions, not sure. And also, as part of a person's history, uh, a person would have some other markers too, like depression. <laughs> a person would have some other markers such as, oh, a history of this prior. Uh, so that's, that's a really important point, but it is really key for a good clinician to help with the assessment on for risk. Um, however, OCD tends to create the most problems um, out of many different disorders, so it's often treated first, at least in my experience and the colleagues that I work with. Uh, I'm actually going to skip the specific case examples uh, so that y'all can actually ask your questions if you wish. Um, so substance abuse, one of those detours. You're doing ERP, substance abuse can really, really detour treatment if we're not serious about it. Okay. So lack of pro proper dosing, we're used to hearing maybe the term dosing when it comes to a medication. Um, well, therapy also needs to be thought of. The evidence-based treatment is studied in certain ways, and not to say that it's not creatively applied or there's not an artistic creative side to it. Yeah, there's the personalized side to it, and each person is different, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a uh, tried and true... Um, way to study and to research uh, and to understand uh, some very cut and dry things. And <laughs> we use the Y-box scale um, as clinicians uh, in especially OCD treatment to assess the severity. Um, so out of a total 50 on the Y-box 2, rather, um, a 40 would be the highest on the Y-box 1. That doesn't equate with, oh, okay, well, come in when you feel like it. The therapy recommendation is going to have to be some pretty high frequency. I mean, if it's a 40 Y box 2 scale, um, <laughs> that's, that is not going to fly. A person is going to um, need potentially home visits, uh, frequent sessions throughout the week, maybe residential treatment. So uh, we need to make sure that we're doing proper dosing of treatment. Uh, and there can be a lot of reasons not to do it. It's never to criticize or never to judge, but we want to assess and want to see, is there any way that we can do more with this? Or, surprise, surprise, any way we can do less? I have some clients who um, I will intentionally challenge them to give a longer break because they feel that reassurance coming in. And so we sometimes need to space out the sessions even further. Uh, Medication-wise, of course, higher dosing might be needed, which, by the way, the dosing typically of SSRIs is almost double uh, the effective, each person's different, but the therapeutic dosing is almost double what's used for just 
general anxiety or depression. Uh, so that's one of the dips and issues that comes up. In the research, I was talking about one and a half hour, two times a week sessions, like with Edna Foa um, when doing research. Um, so when we get to the practicability for a lot of people in and out patients, and if you take insurance or if a provider takes insurance, sometimes those things are tricky, but we're going to try and line them up as much as we can because the more we depart from what the evidence base says, well, the more we are more likely not to get those results that the evidence base approach has got. Okay. So uh, severe symptoms or impairments, higher level of recommendation. I already mentioned uh, residential, a lot of wonderful places that are not the same as uh, what we see in the movies. Those are by and large misnomers. Maybe stuff has happened like in movies, but um, we're talking about places dedicated to getting better uh, and hopefully quicker, uh, quicker than can be done outpatient. Okay, relapse prevention planning, that last thing. So if we don't plan for discharge, if we don't plan for what comes after therapy, a client is more likely to relapse. A client is more likely to relapse if they have untreated compulsions as well. Uh, it can greatly improve outcomes to talk about, hey, what do we do if we run into a new obsession or an old obsession and you start compulsing? Do you want to reach back out if it's a day that you compulse? Or do you want to set that as if I'm compulsing over several days and having a difficult time keeping that at bay? Or do you want to just see how it goes and follow up and uh, as you go along and use your family support to help clue you in, hey, I've noticed this. What's going on? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, the relapse prevention planning is uh, not only helpful, it's built into the process of how effective exposure is done. So we know OCD is not cured for now, so having a good plan of attack long-term is useful. People can live in, uh, in full recovery. Um, so I have clients that have scored high on that Y-box scale and at the end of treatment, they scored subclinical. And then I followed up with clients at later points and they still were subclinical. It happens, uh, it exists. Um, so you don't have to be discouraged about that. But we also want to appreciate that uh, for whatever, I talk about this in my basic year, basic OCD talk, uh, whether it's genetic or environmental variables or whatever else that it can open back up again. So be ready for it. Plan on that. Two great handouts here. You can click the hyperlinks in the presentation. Okay. So three things. This was on my social media today. When ready to end treatments, clients manifest three things. The ability to completely or almost completely refrain from compulsion. Self-efficacy in designing and practicing an exposure with no therapist input and minimal adverse impacts of daily routine. So I'm going to be looking for those things um, and collaboratively working with clients. Um, so, oh, actually, this isn't my last pitfall. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so seeing OCD as too homogenous, by the way, I had hearkened back to the core fear being so... Uh, well, some say it's only a handful of actual core fears, but uh, the process of fear also being sometimes disgust or sadness or shame. If we see OCD as just one thing, it is one thing, but it's also not, then treatment is going to be impacted by that. So for example, uh, one of the areas where I first learned this was with contamination-based obsessions, realizing that uh, if an obsession is linked with a disgust response that it takes more exposures to that obsession uh, to reach success in, um, in habituation uh, with that. Um, it can be more resilient. So it's a little different, but it's the same. I mean, ERP is the same, uh, and there's some ways that we can adjust and edit to better point towards disgust. Uh, and I do that in my practice. Um, so seeing it, though, as just one thing is going to be problematic. It's not just anxiety. Um, it's not just one thing. Uh, 
Also, those who have severe OCD will talk about many of the differences from the person who has mild OCD. They feel really alone when they hear the story of somebody who has mild OCD and talk about their quicker success. So sessions range drastically. The stress is, fancy word, multifactorial. <laughs> Some clients are more bothered by their compulsions. Some feel like they actually find comfort in them. That's another comment for another day. Okay, so solutions with this. Um, well, acknowledging and appreciating those variations in emotions and sensations, like shame with pedophile OCD, the person who feels um, completely torn down, worn down by intrusions that say you're a pedophile. These thoughts, you must be a pedophile. They feel like they must be a pedophile. Um, we got to work with even though the treatment is the same, you got to appreciate that those feelings might be a little bit different. Clients with other compulsion or other obsessions might still experience shame, you know, like checking, uh, like the shame of, ah, oh, I checked again and I didn't want to. But as far as the actual checking involved, there's not often a lot of shame that's reported in my experience, but automatically it is tied up in the obsessional content. Uh, these, these feelings. And so um, we don't spend undue time in the content because that feeds the obsession, but we may have to actually support that person in the, the shame that they feel and or do exposures specifically to the shame that they feel as well. Uh, there's differences too based on insight, and there are various ways to build insight. Um, I covered this in the basics presentation, but uh, cognitive therapy for OCD is, can be an effective treatment. It is in its own right. It's not considered the gold standard, but we have to do more cognitive interventions with the higher cognitive domains of sexual, religious obsessions. Also, um, sometimes with poor insight, we might have to do more cognitive therapy, Socratic questioning, um, uh, motivational interviewing techniques, etc. cetera. Uh, so, there's a lot of differences and we need to appreciate uh, the heterogeneous nature of OCD. So keep practicing functional assessment, a uh, whole thing in and of itself, but where you understand the function of your behavior, the function of your thought. We have to pay attention to, okay, like how did this behavior fit in? Because if we don't pay attention to uh, new behaviors that come up or how it fits into the equation, we could miss compulsions. Uh, and all sorts of things that need to be subsumed under the treatment. All right, so Drake, yeah, get that intrusive thought before resisting, avoiding, after, yeah. You say, okay, all right, intrusive thought. Maybe I'm a serial killer, okay, maybe. Yep, maybe I'm a terrible person, okay. maybe. Uh, maybe I ran over somebody and I didn't check. I'm going to go to jail. Okay. Uh, that's some of the stuff that uh, a lot of clients early on have a really hard time understanding and understandably so. It seems really counterintuitive and exposure is. But remember, we're dealing with intrusive unwanted thoughts and so we have to train. We have to do this training day uh, for uh, dealing with all the compulsions. Okay, so Kabi, for those of you that are familiar, I really love this guy. Uh, first step for OCD, let's look for hidden traumas, right? Experimental medications, psychoanalyzing meaningless obsessions and trying literally everything else or exposure and response prevention. Okay. So want to appreciate the simplicity, but also the complexity of these things. Uh, so we're at the hour and a half mark. Um, in some places I advertise that I do an hour and a half plus um, based on questions. We've had some great ones throughout. Uh, do we have any other questions? I uh, still see there's several folks live here. Don't worry, I can't see you specifically. So, <laughs> um, but what else? What else is coming up? I'm just so glad to be here, by the way. I'm just going to take a pause while. Um, folks, maybe take a moment to type in a comment and just thank you for being here. 
Um, if you suffer with OCD, there's hope. If you're a family member, there's hope. Friend, loved one, clinician. Okay, quiet crowd. It's 7.30 Central Time. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump into, oh, hey, hey, there we go. We're getting some questions here. <laughs> All right, Mr. Nate, um, my clutch question answered here tonight. I've been trying to do exposures to one of my intrusive thoughts has been going well, so that when uh, sometimes when I go out to do the exposures, now I find my mind wandering to other things. And then the next one, should I be actively trying to refocus my mind on the intrusive thoughts, or should I not be trying to direct my thoughts at all, either towards or against the intrusive thoughts? Yeah. So, first of all, good job. <laughs> it's going well. Um, so far, man, intrusive thoughts, if you, for those of you on here that suffer with OCD, you know just so difficult and so uncomfortable in, in the themes and we oftentimes tend to say it attacks the very things that we uh, care most about. Um, so first of all, wondering to do, you're having success. Um, so let me go ahead and take a mock example. Um, let's say you're not saying this, just to be clear for the video, this person has not said that this is what the intrusive thought is specifically. Um, so if the intrusive thought is, what if I harm my child? Pops in, um, a lot of moms get this with postpartum OCD, a lot of dads get this, a lot of guys uh, get this. Um, and so exposure script is going to be facing those things that pop into a person's mind. Their mind's already generating it. So instead of just letting it spin out of control, we're going to point it. We're going to focus it. So Nate has been trying some uh, exposures to intrusive thoughts. And so when the mind starts to wonder, uh, that's not a problem. You know, first of all, if anybody's, and Nate, if you've done mindfulness exercises, uh, most mindfulness exercises say, um, bring your attention back to dot, 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 the breathing or this meditation or whatever else. It's okay. It's normal. So if the brain didn't wonder, we wouldn't have the ability to be aware of many different inputs. So for example, um, I'm aware of the camera here, my streaming software. I've got my second monitor here with my presentation. I've got my phone with my time got my lapel mic, some lighting, things like that. It's pretty cool because we have the ability to be aware of a lot of different things. So I was aware that my power plug wasn't appropriately plugged in earlier on. This would have totally cut out midway through um, without realizing that that would, was what that was. Uh, and so at any given point, we are going to have all sorts of stimuli coming in. And it's a skill and it's a discipline, of course, to stay present. Um, and uh, at least I think, um, and those around me, those in the professional community, uh, reinforce this. Um, it's in uh, John Hirschfeld's, one of his most recent mindfulness books, just how unrealistic it is to expect that your mind's just going to focus on one thing or just go blank or whatever else. So we need to appreciate that that's going to happen. So... Should you actively refocus then on intrusive thoughts? In a mindfulness meditation, you might try to intentionally bring your attention back to something. Or should you not be trying to direct your thoughts at all? Um, I don't know if you're doing this work with a uh, clinician, etc. If so, good question to ask them, of course. Um, but the it, it depends on the function. So I mentioned the functional assessment, which I go into depth on that in the basic ERP talk that I gave. Um, so what, what is the function? Because if you are no longer being bothered by it, so let's say I write a script of, so I have the terrible thought about harming my kids and, um, it's certain that I 
end up doing it and then I go to jail and dot, 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 and you write out this exposure script and you're looking at it. And when you're doing your exposure, you're sitting with that, maybe you're writing it out 20 times a day, 10 times a day, and then you look at it once a day when you get to a, a better spot. Uh, if you're looking at it and you're kind of at level one distress or zero and you're getting distracted, well, from an exposure standpoint, you've done what you need to do if you're not complacent. And so that's when I tell clients, um, great, time to move on <laughs> to a different exposure. Uh, put some weights on the weight set so you can get stronger with it. Now, you can still practice even if it's zero distress uh, level. I tell clients to do this in relapse prevention planning to still practice as you go. But as long as a person is fulfilling what the exposure is intended to do, um, the point isn't that they have to spend hours and hours and hours on one specific topic necessarily. Now, if there's still desired avoidance or if there's rumination with that, um, then look into that and address that. So I hope that answered uh, that question at least suitable. Thank you, Nate. Great one. Okay, next one. Uh, when seeking a therapist, what should we ask them in regards to ERP? <laughs> yeah, good one. Uh, do you do it? <laughs> um, so actually, the best way uh, that I have seen uh, organized, summarized to approach finding a therapist who specializes in OCD uh, is put out by the International OCD Foundation. Uh, I think it's title like how to find a therapist or questions to ask. And it's a great list of things. Um, and it can be done very respectfully. I understand it can feel a little uncomfortable vetting a professional provider who has a degree and training and so forth. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like we do that with medication with a doctor. But we need to advocate for our treatment. We need to ask good questions. If nothing else, we need to feel uh, reasonably confident uh, or maybe not feel confident, but uh, gain the confidence, right, of uh, does this person know what they're talking about? So what you could do, uh, the simple ones are when reaching out, just looking for the basics, like are you a CBT clinician? Um, you Actually, if you ask them as open questions, a lot of times you'll get a better answer because a person can easily say, in response to, do you do ERP? A person's like, yeah, oh yeah, ERP, sure, yeah, I've done it. And maybe what they've done is a few times with a few clients, the client said, I'm afraid of this, and so they tried to whip up an exposure. But if you ask them, like, what is the evidence-based uh, treatments you use, or, or do you use evidence-based treatments, and if so, what? Um, have them tell you, have them work for it. <laughs> um, and a lot of other questions that you can find in this article from the IOCDF. But those are the sorts of things that we're going to be looking for. We're looking for certain words and phrases. Like, again, this one's a little more simple. CBT has the gold standard. Um, and so if a person's like, yeah, I just want to do talk therapy, okay, um, ask some more questions. And then um, looks like there's a couple other questions. Back to my question regarding compulsions. I find that the more I resist the compulsion, the more I focus on it. And I'm constantly thinking about not doing it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and is this... Yeah, I think this goes together. I feel some habituation, but at the same time feel like I'm developing a fear of the compulsion. Kind of an all-or-nothing approach that I don't know is the right approach. Mm -hmm. And then I feel... Like sometimes I want to mess up, huh? <laughs> yeah, messing up. Uh, one of my articles, Practice Failure, uh, where we intentionally allow ourselves to make a mistake, right? I'm not going to ask a person to violate their overall values, but lean into those discomforts. That's good. Okay, so, um, yeah. One thing in the language of resisting a compulsion we're starting in the clinical world to change that. So no worries, by the way, still a lot of times we'll say resist. Many clinicians use that. And that's not bad. That's not wrong. Um, actually, uh, I remember specifically um, one of the clinicians that contributed to a, uh, I won't throw them under the bus uh, specifically, but 
uh, in one of the trainings, a clinician that wrote one of the key manuals on treating children and adolescents on the resistance to compulsions that they realized in the revised version they needed to change the language to that because it's not about fighting the compulsion because uh, if you're fighting, uh, the more you resist, right, the more it persists uh, in all things fear-related and, and OCD. Uh, and so it could be that you need, it could be several things, but you might need to do a deeper dive into um, assessing how you're trying to not do the compulsion. Because if, if it's too tense, if it's too tight, if it's, okay, I'll force myself to get out and drive, or I'll force myself to write this script, uh, it's the how, of course, that makes a really big difference. Um, and if there is a hyper-focus or analyzing something you're constantly thinking about, I mean, constantly thinking about, of course, is, it can be, uh, well, is, yeah. Compulsion. I can't think of an instance where constantly thinking about something isn't some sort of compulsion or problematic kind of pathological response. And so you probably have to reassess that. Like, okay, how am I doing this? And offering the direction of what am I doing instead? Um, and you said you feel some habituation at the same time, but developing fear of the compulsion. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I um, suppose I can't say too much more without a specific example of that, except uh, fears come up in all sorts of ways. Like clients will tell me that they have fears about the obsession, about the compulsion, about recovery. Clients have fears about their kids getting OCD, having OCD, um, just hypothetically or actually, uh, et cetera. So uh, if you're noticing all or nothing thinking, by the way, just last mention on that last comment that you made, second comment, um, all or nothing thinking from a cognitive standpoint is a cognitive distortion. And though the therapy is oftentimes largely behavioral uh, in the sense that we're attacking those compulsions rituals, even if they're mental, um, sometimes we have to do um, what we definitely need to do, some cognitive work. We have these uh, maladaptive views and beliefs that we're actually holding to, uh, which is not the same as reasoning with obsessions. Uh, so we don't reason with obsessions. They're meaningless, they're intrusive, they're unwanted, but we do have to sometimes spend time with the all or nothing thinking. So a couple of ideas uh, that there could be some cognitive distortions um, with that black and white has to go a certain way, maybe some perfectionistic just right based on what you shared, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so hopefully that's uh, helpful, just of course speaking from a general standpoint. Um, so y'all have been so great. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for joining. Uh, feel free to, uh, to reach me on my website, justinkhughes.com, other contact information. Subscribe to my newsletter, follow on the socials. Uh, absolutely. Check out these resources, IOCDF, OCD Texas, OCD Game Changers, and uh, really, really uh, Glad that, uh, that y'all are here. So to go ahead and uh, bump some tunes for you while running the references, I'm going to put these up and in the night. Uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, what did you like? What did I miss? What more would you like to see? Uh, would you like uh, me to do a different type of talk in the future? Uh, what would help? Um, I, I'm literally open for any ideas uh, as far as what can help. Um, and it's just based on my own time and limits. But it's truly you and clients that help me understand what's needed. It's why I do things like this and live streams. All right. Have a good night. So good to see you. I'm Justin K. Hughes, licensed professional counselor. Uh, there is hope.